Um, I want to, well, let me tell you a couple things first before we go. First of all, no, let me show you a video. No, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty confused right now. Um, uh, we closed escrow on our land this week, so we own that property now. <laughs> Bad news is now we have to pay for it. Um, <laughs> But uh, things are looking good with the county. We're moving forward. Things are uh, looking better and better every day. And uh, we, we may have uh, some uh, hearings coming up. And so we'll let you know about that because it'd be good for you to show up. Um, and then a uh, small thing, FYI, because I know a lot of you guys bring your Bibles. And I've been in using the New International Version and uh, NIV. And I'm switching to the ESV. I've been uh, studying that for the last couple of years, and, and I, I really like it. There's, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, I, I just, uh, it's kind of a midlife thing. Some people get a new car, I get a new Bible. Um, <laughs> just if you're following along. Um, and then uh, I, I want to I show you a video right now. This is from um, one of our partners in ministry, a guy named K.P. O'Hannon. Uh, with Gospel for Asia. We, we support their ministry. We had a son here speak a little while back. Um, a lot of you guys support children that are in India. And here's the president, KP. And, and he sent a video message to a lot of us who support his ministry. And I thought it'd be good to just show the whole church about something that's going on in India. So if you would watch. Hi, my name is KP Yohanand, president of Gospel for Asia. I count it my privilege to come to you today on the behalf of tens of thousands of suffering Christians, our brothers and sisters in the state of Orissa in Northeast India. They're going through huge suffering, brutally abused, murdered, their houses burned down, pastors killed. We have never seen anything like this in India in a long, long time. This morning I asked my secretary this question. How can a human being look into the eyes of an old woman or a young man or child and cut them into pieces with a sharp sword? She paused and said, it has to be demons working. Well, that's what's happening for our brothers and sisters in Orissa today. During these past five, six days, we have seen at least six of our believers been brutally murdered all because of their faith in Christ. Hundreds of Christian homes were completely demolished, destroyed. Over 20 church buildings destroyed. You say, who is doing it? What's going on? Well, this all began just a week ago when a Hindu priest was murdered by communist and the anti-Christian fundamentalist simply said, no, it was done by Christians. And thousands of people went on a rampage, village after village, destroying houses of believers. And right now, thousands of Christians ran away into the forest and jungles for their life. This morning, our senior leader called from Orissa. He was crying on the telephone. And I said, Julia, what's happening? What's the latest? He said he just talked to a couple of our pastors in the jungles and they are there with their believers, several hundreds of them. And one pastor said, I had a chance to escape with my life, but I decided to stay with my people. If they come and kill us, I am willing to die with my people. My brothers and sisters, I hold in my hand sheets of paper that describe over 75 separate attacks on believers, churches, all over Orissa. I can't begin to read all these and, and do it in a couple of minutes time, but here I read about a sister who was burned to death, another one raped, and another one, 40 shops were destroyed, belonged to the Dalit Christians, and on and on. And another one, tortured alive, they poured kerosene on him and tried to kill him and so many now in the hospitals. You know, in, in the beginning of the video, he says, you know, nothing like this has happened in a long, long time. And, and that really struck me when I saw the video message because 
You got to understand, it, things are a lot different in India. And K.P. Ohanan, he has thousands of church plants, thousands of pastors under him, thousands that he's trained. And all of these guys that go out and start churches in India, they all assume they're going to get beat up. It's, it's not like, oh, I might be one of those weird ones that gets beat up for the sake of the gospel. They just know going into these villages that they don't know what's ahead of them. And most of them get, almost all of them, maybe all of them, get, get beat up at some point in their lives. And so when he says, we've never seen anything like this uh, that's going on right now in the state of Orissa just this past week, I go, okay, that's, that's pretty major as uh, these people are getting to burn to death and, and stuff like that and churches are getting burned down and homes are getting burned down. I bring that up because I, I just really encourage you this week to really get beyond uh, your American mindset, our American mindset, and think that you know, everything's like it is here. Uh, remember, we, we in America, there's, there's like 300 million of us. That's it, 300 million. In Asia, there are 4 billion Okay, and that's, that's the world, and sometimes we can get thinking like, wow, it's all about us, and I really encourage you guys to this week be, 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 be praying for them, and in fact, even, even right now, I'd love to pray for them, and I, I know, I understand that a lot of you come in here, and you've got burdens, and uh, I understand that at the same time, we're sitting in an air-conditioned room, Okay. And we've got brothers and sisters who are having gasoline poured upon them and being burned to death. And I go, okay, I know we have problems, but let's get outside of ourselves for a moment. And would you join me in a word of prayer for our brothers and sisters in Orisa right now? God, I just, I just don't even know what to say. We have never faced anything even remotely close to what they're going through right now. And so, Lord, we just try to escape our, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and just go, God, they need our prayers, that you would focus your attention on them, that your Holy Spirit would minister to them. I pray for those who are being tortured right now, this very second, that they would not back down, that they would have a strength about them, a peace about them. May they be like Stephen in the book of Acts, where their faces would be like faces of angels, Lord. And everyone that's persecuting them would just know that what they believe is the truth. And God, I pray for those who are persecuting them right now. God, would you speak to them? Would you do like what you did with Saul and just explain to them the truth? I pray for these believers that they would continue to love their enemies and those who are persecuting them. God, all our prayers are with them right now, this morning. And God, I know you hear us from heaven. And however this works, Lord, somehow I just pray that they would somehow sense our prayers, feel our prayers. Through the Holy Spirit, may there be a boldness in them and a peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul says to Timothy, and I think it's appropriate after watching that video in, in chapter three, verse one, he says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. When Paul is talking about the last times, you know, the end times here, he's talking about the time that we live in and also the time that he lived in, any time after the period of Christ. And when you read Acts, you see that they talk about how they were in the end times and how he says, he says look, you, you've seen my life. He tells this young pastor, he goes, you saw how I was tortured. You saw how I was beat up for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we got to remember that that goes on around the world. And we got to understand that a lot of persecution happens here in America. And a lot of us don't get persecuted because we don't speak up. But you guys know, once you start speaking up, that's when the persecution comes. I mean, the truth is, is people in India don't have to be persecuted. If they would just shut up about Jesus Christ and not stand up for what they believe, they can dodge the persecution as well. But Paul explains, no, in the end times, it's going to be difficult. He just told Timothy, okay, you're, you're a young pastor. You're just getting going here. He goes, make sure you're patient. Make sure you're loving. Make sure you're gentle. But then he goes, but understand these are some difficult, difficult times that we live in. It's not going to be easy to follow. And, and we, uh, he goes on, I'm sorry, he goes on in verse 2, and he explains why it's going to be difficult. 
In verse 2, he says, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Okay, first I was going to go to verse 9. I realized I'm not going to be able to cover all that. And then, uh, and then my plan was to get to verse 5, and I found out last service, I, I can't even cover that. So uh, don't get panicked if we don't finish it because I don't plan on it now. Um, but he explains how people are going to act in the end times. And he says, understand that it's going to be really hard because people are going to love themselves. They're going to love money. They're going to be proud. They're going to be arrogant. And he lists off these 19 different characteristics of the way people will be in the end times. And as I read them to you, we all just kind of nod our heads, right? Like, yep, 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 yep. Check, check, check. I got, I got that one, that one, that one. And, and on and on and on. And he says it's going to be so common, but you have to understand that what he's talking about is he's saying within the church. He's not talking about the world. It's always been that way in the world. But he goes, understand what, what's sad is this is going to happen in the church because he, he explains that, that there are going to be people who have some sort of form or some sort of appearance of godliness or some sort of a form of spirituality, but they'll deny its power. And Paul's warning this pastor. He goes, watch out because this is what people are going to be after. And later he says, in fact, they're going to find churches that'll tickle their ears. They're going to find churches that'll say what they want to hear because they love themselves. And they want these things for themselves. And so they won't put up with sound doctrine. They'll go to these other places. And he's just warning this young pastor, be careful. Because I'm not just talking about a few individuals. I'm not talking about these crazy, evil, you know, strange, unique individuals in the world. He goes, I'm saying people. People in general are going to be like this way. People within the church. And that's a scary part. Is that's the way people will be inside of the church. And we have to be so careful of this. But the key, I think, of understanding all of these 19 characteristics is understanding this first one. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Why is it going to be so hard to live out our faith? He says, because so many people, the vast majority of people will love themselves. They're not lovers of God. They're lovers of self. And many people will attend church not because they love God, but because they love themselves. And they're hoping God will do something for them. It's not out of a love for God. It's out of a love for self. And, it's, and, and I, I heard one commentator say this, and I love this phrase. He, he talks about how, you know, if you're lovers of self, then all these other things will happen. He says it's the sewer pipe. Lovers of themselves, it's the sewer pipe out of which all the other garbage flows. In other words, look, if you love yourself, of course you're going to love money. Because you'll start thinking, you know what? I'm, I love myself. And so I want to indulge myself. So I want money because I want stuff for me. Why do people love money? It's because they love themselves. Why, do, why are people proud? Because they love themselves. They think they're lovable. You know, why are they arrogant? Why are they abusive? Why are people abusive? You know, when we make an abusive statement towards someone else, it's because you're thinking about, you're not thinking about loving them. I mean, haven't there been times when you would, some things come out of your mouth and it almost surprises you that you could actually say something like that to someone else? Why? Because at that moment, you're loving yourself so much. You're just about defending yourself. You're just about making yourself feel good. Why? Because it's all about you. You're a lover of yourself, you're disobedient to parents, abusive, ungrateful. All this, he goes, comes out of this sewer pipe called loving yourself. And uh, you know people who really love themselves? Do you guys know people who love themselves? Yeah? It's a good thing we're not that way, right? Um, <laughs> See, here's, here's the struggle in all of this is Paul is listing characteristics that are so common, so common, and it's going to be so, so popular and is so popular. And for some reason, 
And I was trying to figure out when this starts, but somehow in our minds, we all struggle with this, this idea that if everyone, if everyone, if the vast majority is doing it, it can't be that wrong. I, I think it starts from, from grade school. You don't want to be the weird kid, right? Sorry if you were, but you know, it's, it's just that whole idea of you, I want to be one of those that fits in with the group. I don't want to be that weird person. And carries on at junior high, even though everyone's a weird person in junior high. And then, and then you get to high school, but it's that whole, man, I don't, I wanna, I don't wanna be the, that one weird person, that one odd person, that strange, and, and there's something about, well, everyone's doing this, so it makes it okay, and we never quite grow out of it. And it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous because Paul says, look, this is the way people are going to be. People outside the church, people inside the church, the vast majority, and somehow we always feel this sense of this isn't that bad because everyone is doing it. It can't be that bad because everyone, even within the church, I see people call themselves Christians and they do this, they do this, they do this, and so we somehow feel a confidence, a strength in numbers, when in reality we should feel extremely insecure in numbers. Because when in, the, when in the history of this world have the majority been right? It's always been about a few individuals that have been able to stand out. That's why Paul's telling Timothy, man, this is going to be a fight. Do you understand that people are going to be this way, not just outside the church, but inside the church, and they're going to call themselves Christians and have some sort of form of godliness, but they're not really going to do it. Are you going to be a part? See, because the Bible tells me that there's this wide, wide, massive, huge road, and many are going to find it, and, they're going to, and it heads to destruction. He goes, but then there's this narrow, narrow road that leads to life and few will find it. And Paul's saying, Timothy, you gotta understand, this is not gonna get any better. You get in for a fight. Get ready for a fight because the majority of the people, even within the church, are gonna be heading down this road and having some form of godliness. He's not talking about atheists here. He's not talking about people that are saying, screw God, I don't want any of this. He's talking about people that'll call themselves Christians and say that they're believers, but you can look at their lives and see that there's no power in it. There's no power of sanctification. They're not really changed. And he goes, man, avoid these types of people. It's going to get really, really difficult because the majority is going to go down this road. And yet, when has the majority been right? I mean, go, go back to the children of Israel. I mean, why did they have to wander in the desert all those years and die off? Because only like a couple of people believed. Because only two spies came back and said, oh, no, 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 we can, I believe in God. No one else believed in him. He said, you know what? I'm just going to let you guys wander in the desert till you all die. How many people fit in the ark? How many people were right and fit in that ark? What was the percentage? What do you think the percentage was of the narrow road there? Paul's saying, look, listen, listen, Timothy, people are going to go a certain direction. You're going to be tempted to go in this direction and people will live this way but, but you, you're a man of God. You don't go there. Okay, you don't go that direction. He goes, but it's going to be hard because people are going to be lovers of themselves. And, and there are patterns, you know, like someone, uh, someone was reading, I was so good, and I don't remember who, but he talked about how, you know, we don't want to conform to the pattern of this world. And it's true that, that, that in general, Christians do pretty good with that. Let's not conform to the pattern of this world. But there's also a pattern in the church. There's a pattern of American churchgoers. And we just figure, well, they are all churchgoers and they all do this. That must be right. And Paul's warning is, be careful. It's going to be difficult in the last days because people, churchgoers that have a semblance or a, they look like godly people, they look like they're, they, they, you know, and they call themselves Christians. He goes, they're going to love themselves just like everyone else. In fact, lovers of self, that first phrase, did you even know that was a sin? Did you hear about that spoken about a whole lot? Oh, I'm worried I'm loving myself too much. In fact, it's something that's so common and so popular that it's even encouraged. And there's a problem with you if you don't love yourself enough. I was thinking about this yesterday, for some reason, as I'm putting this together, a song pops into my head, and you, never, you ever hear a song that you've been singing your whole life, or you just remember it from childhood, and yet you never really thought about the words, you just sang it? 
you know? And, and this song pops into my head as I'm, because I, I think it's because out of this verse, I just finally realized, wow, that's what it says. And, and it wasn't some weird, raunchy band. Whitney Houston. Remember, remember Whitney Houston? Many of us slow danced to her songs. And, uh, and it was the greatest love of all. Remember that song? We've all heard that. The greatest. You know, and at the very end, you know how in the very end where it just comes that climax or she's of all, you know, you know, the greatest love of all. And then she goes, it's easy to achieve. Then what does she say? Learning to love yourself. It is the greatest love of all. Did you ever know that? I, I, never, I never realized that's what she said. You know, and I was thinking, wait, does she say this? And then I looked it up online. She, that's the song. <laughs> the greatest love of all. This is the greatest love of all. And it's easy to achieve. You got that right. <laughs> I didn't even have to work at that one. But learning to love yourself, that's the greatest love of all. And yet Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. When you think about it, loving yourself is the opposite of love. God says to love him the most. He says, I want you to love me most. From the very beginning, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. Every single thing that's about you should just be consumed with this burning love for God, not a love for self, He says, but watch out because in the end times, people, man, they're not going to be lovers of God. I mean, the number one most important command, God the Father said it, you know, and Jesus said it. He goes, the greatest love, the most important love is that you love God. This is the greatest command, love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And he's saying, look, at the end times, he goes, man, they're going to be lovers of self. They're going to be lovers of pleasure. They're not going to be lovers of God. And I want us to to evaluate this thing and really evaluate, man, am I a lover of God or am I a lover of self? Why I'm in this room, is it because I'm crazy about me? And I've heard people say this, and you've probably heard it too. People say, you know what? But the Bible says, and I've heard this from a lot of Christians, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so they go, you know what? I don't think I love myself enough. And if I don't love myself enough, how am I going to love my neighbor as myself? So I'm just going to work on loving me more. Have you heard that before? Where people say, you know what, I, I just, I feel like I, I have to love myself more. I'm depressed right now, so I must not love myself enough. When the truth is, is those people who want to keep talking about how they need to love themselves more Talk about that. Those are actually the people that are most infatuated with themselves. In fact, they can't talk about anyone else except themselves. Now they'll call you on the phone and say, let's get together and let's, let's talk about me <laughs> and how miserable I am and how I can love me more because I don't love myself enough. Can you come help me? And then when I'm done with you, I'm going to call someone else and we're going to talk about me. You guys understand that the most depressed people on this planet are also the most self-centered. They can't get their minds off of their own problems, their own issues themselves. They can't think about someone else. You guys, it's a horrible trap. You guys, self-centeredness leads to misery. Self-love leads to misery. How many people who love themselves are truly happy, are truly fulfilled? You'll work yourself into a depression if you are all about you. It's just going to happen. And then you'll get mad at yourself because you love yourself so much. And you don't want to be that way. Because these words of God, it's not to destroy our lives. The Bible is very clear. God, the creator, gives us these commands so that we can have life. That's why Jesus came 
And he says, in this road of loving yourself and learning to love yourself, it is not the greatest love of all. It'll make you miserable. Having said that, I love being me. I do, okay? I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you right now. If you said you could be anyone on earth, I would say, I'll be Francis Chan. I, I love being me. I really do. I think it's great. I would rather be me than you. Any day, any day. I'm just laying it out there. But, but okay, so, so under, but, but why? Why do I love being me? I love being me because I was crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You know why I love being me? It's because when Jesus Christ came into my life, when the Holy Spirit came into my life, he really started to make some changes in me. And he got me to stop talking about me so much. And he got me to not just be consumed about me so much. See, because I actually don't like Francis Chan. I love Christ inside of me. That's what I love. I love the changes. I love every day. You know, the more and more I can, and, and I'm not saying I'm there. I mean, there's times I get off the phone. I'm like, man, that was all about me. I'm sick of myself. I don't want to be about myself, but I love this adventure of having God come into my body and me becoming this new creation and, and being less and less self-absorbed and saying, well, I don't really care about Francis. I'm starting to care more and more about these other people. I'm, I'm caring more about his agenda and his desires and and as I do that, there's a fulfillment in life. It feels good to love, doesn't it? This is, aren't there just, I was just talking to some people who just got back from the Bay Area last weekend, you know, just building and, and helping these people in the inner city. I mean, they're just so fired up. I'm talking to one of the guys on the phone on the way home, he's like, oh, it's the greatest trip ever, man. Everyone was working so hard, you know, we're just exhausted at night, but it just felt good. It felt good. We're laughing, we're serving, we're helping these. It feels good to love. It feels so good to get out of yourself and not love yourself, but to start loving other people. And like, like Philippians 2 says, to consider others as more important than yourself. It's a good thing. And that's what he's saying here. But he goes, be careful, because at the end times, people are going to love themselves. I, I love the way this one uh, <coughs> commentator put it. He says this. He goes, in this universe, there's God, there are people, and there are things. We should worship God, love people, and use things. <coughs> But if we start worshiping ourselves, we'll ignore God and start loving things and using people. This is the formula for a miserable life, yet it characterizes many people today. The worldwide craving for things is just one evidence that people's hearts have turned away from God. I love that. He just nails it. He goes, man, that's a recipe for disaster. You start loving stuff. And why do we love stuff? See, after he says people will be lovers of themselves, the next phrase, he goes, and they'll be lovers of money. Why do, we, why do we love money? Why are we lovers of money? Because we love ourselves. Why do I love all this stuff? Because I love me, and me enjoys spending this stuff on me. Me enjoys using this stuff for me. I, I love myself, and so let me indulge. And he says, you know what, everyone's going to be this way. People are going to be so into stuff, so materialistic, that we just think, well, everyone's that way. So no big deal. People in Noah's day could have said that. They did say that. Come on. Everyone lives this way. And Paul's telling Timothy, everyone's going to live this way. So don't walk out of this room going, oh, man, those people. Look at yourself and go, man, I don't want to be swept up. I don't want to be caught up in this. And I know, the Bible says in the last days, people are going to love, love, love their stuff. And they're going to love their stuff and, and they'll use people to get their stuff. And it shows that they really don't love God. They really love things. They love these possessions. Here's the danger. If we love ourselves and love money more than we love others, be careful, evaluate if this is you. 
we will get to a point where we will be more concerned about our standard of living than we are about others living. I'm going to say it again. We can get to a point where we are more concerned about our standard of living than we are about other human beings actually living. Let's face it. No one in this room is worried about starving to death. What's the worst that could happen? You lose everything, and then what? You go to a food pantry in town, and then go to the park and drink water? We're not worried about starving. We're not worried about living. I mean, the Bible, when, when it talks about not worrying, and someone read that verse, you know, about seeking first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you, that's talking about people that were scared. I might not be able to eat tomorrow. And Jesus, don't even worry about that. We're not worried about those things. That's a given. We live in America. Who's going to start? You got to work hard to starve to death here in America. You just got to say no to everyone that's wanting to pass you food, you know, no to all the rescue missions, no to all the food pantries. No, I'm not even going to go to the park and drink out of that drinking fountain. Meanwhile, there are people that are walking miles and miles every night, moms that are staying up all night walking for miles to get clean water for their kids and hopefully to bring back this stuff. I mean, I'm reading those stats, those stats on your water bottle, the stats on those, you know, why do we have you focus on these things? And we're going, man, you can't understand how people live. And we got to be more consumed and concerned about them living than we are about our standard of living because that's what we worry about. We all worry about money to some degree. You say, no, I don't worry. You worry a little bit. We all do to some degree, but again, we're not worried about living. We're worried about a standard of living. We're worried, well, what if I lose my house? God forbid. What what if I can't own my own house? That means the whole time on earth I was renting? (laughs) That means at the end of my life when everything burns, I'm not going to have a house that'll burn? You know, it's, it's, just, it's, it's a standard of living. We're worried about, well, what about this car? What about that car? What if I don't get to drive this type of car? What about when I'm older? And maybe, you know, the, the home that I get put in isn't as nice as the one I'd like to be put in. Or maybe, I, maybe this, maybe that. It's all about standard of living. And I just don't want us to fool ourselves thinking that we don't love money or we don't love a certain type of lifestyle because we're not. We'll say things like, well, I got to feed the family. Come on. Anyone can feed their family in America. You're not worried about that. We're worried about standard of living. And that's why I'm going, man, Lord, I I get caught up. I get sucked up in this thing. And I don't want to be this way. Because I know all throughout history, there have always been those few individuals that have stood it out and said, no, I'm not going to fall into that. I'm not going to fall into this. And people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And to say, you know what, God, I don't want to be that. You know, we we can test ourselves. Um, because you know how, uh, you know how when you lose something, that's when you realize how much you loved it or loved that person. You know, you know, early on in life when you start going out with someone and they dump you, we've all been dumped, right? Um, then you just start bawling. Why? Because you love that person, right? And then later in life it gets even more devastating when some of you, you had your own spouse leave you and you lost your spouse, or maybe they passed away, and it's just devastating. I mean, why are funerals so devastating? Because here's someone we love so much, and they're gone. Because when you love something, and then you lose it, it causes a lot of grief. Do you love stuff? You love your money? When you lose it, does it bug you at all? See, in the end times, people are going to be really just consumed. Like, that's all they can think about. Man, I'm not going to be able to have this. I'm not going to be able to have And they'll be so concerned about that. Why? Because they love themselves and they love their money. Sometimes we can get sick to our stomachs when we lose something. A possession. 
a bank account, a savings account, the stocks drop, just sick to your stomach. Why? Lovers of self, lovers of money, they're going to be proud. The word proud is the word, uh, it means a bragger. It's the one upper, the one that has to get his word in about himself, herself. He says they'll be arrogant. It's, it's the whole, uh, it's, it's just it's pride. It's about me. People get so arrogant nowadays in the church that even when we confront them on sin, you know, like, wait, you can't leave your wife. What is the, the, what's the comment? The comment is, well, God would want me to be happy. So it doesn't matter that the word of God says, well, because God would want you to be, of course he would want you to be, I mean, he's consumed with you because you're so great, right? God would want me to be happy. I wonder if he does anything else other than worry about you and your happiness. Yeah, forget about his holiness, forget about his commands, it's about you and your, I mean, we get so arrogant as to thinking, you know what, it's about me and, and this world revolves around me. In fact, God revolves around me and he's concerned that I'm happy. So yeah, I broke this sin and that sin, but no big deal. He knows, he wants me happy because it's about me. And I come to this church because I love me and everything he can do for me rather than just be passionately in love with this God who has done so much for us. Who's so amazing. It's been so patient. They'll be abusive. I, I talked about that, how, man, we say certain things to other people because we love ourselves. And then it says they'll be disobedient to parents. End times, the vast majority of people under their parents are going to be disobedient to them. They're not going to respect them. And again, like I said, this is just the popular thing. I mean, what kid respects their parents? Obeys their parents. And so we kind of fall in this trap going, okay, so oh, my kid flipped me off. How cute. You know, it's just this whole, wait a second, we, 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 can't, we can't live that way. We can't let that happen in our homes. That's the end times mentality, and we can't fall into that. I debated on whether or not to show you this video. I'm just going to show you a short clip of it, and we have edited it to death um, and bleeped out and everything else. I mean, it was 15 minutes long, but it's only like two minutes long now. So this is the PG version um, of just, you know, our youth pastor went to a couple of the local schools and just interviewed kids and didn't show their faces so they can remain anonymous so you don't beat them when they get home. And, uh, but, uh, I'll just let you watch it. This is just a short section, and this is a clean section for the most part. And, uh, and so this is just, this is the world we live in. Hey, can we interview you guys real quick? What? Uh, we're just doing this project. We're not going to show your faces or anything, but we just want to get your responses on the like, audio part of the video. All right, so the, fir the first question I got is just, uh, what's the craziest thing? that you guys would say goes on at this school that people, like parents, have no clue it goes on at this school? Dome in the bathroom. Getting in the bathroom by a girl. Yeah? That's what's up. Does yeah. that happen a lot? Yeah, it happens a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> you know what's up. It happens a lot. Yeah? Yeah. What about, what about like, drug use at the school? How, how, how big of a percentage would you say of, of people use drugs, like smoke weed? Uh, it's not not that much. Probably like half of the school, probably. Not, not that much. Half of the school. Half of the school. Probably. Forty-five percent. <laughs> yeah. Like not in school. Like before, like they go to school, yeah. they probably took it up. Yeah. But not in school. What What would be the craziest thing that like your friends, like the people you hang out with, would not absolutely would not want their parents to know about them, like that they do? Like pills, illies, yeah. Narcos, Adderall, something like that. Um, Vicodin, morphine. Oxy, Oxycontin, Xanny bars, Somas, or Norcos, different kinds of pills and stuff like that. Just Somas, just the pills. <laughs> Xanny bars, like Xanax, Vicodin. Like crystal meth, weed. They shoot up heroin in the bathroom and do ecstasy. There's drug dealer like deals like during class and stuff. Yeah, like people like to break the law a lot at school. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Just like one thing that your friends are hiding from their parents. <laughs> like everything, <laughs> like like doing drugs, having sex, drinking, partying, just like bad things. Yeah, yeah I agree with her. That's yeah. exactly. Sending naked pictures. <laughs> I'm so yeah. People, people yeah. send naked pictures during classes. Bad text messages. Bad. 
bad text messages? Is it through, uh, like, of themselves? They send naked pictures of themselves to other people? Yeah. 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 To, to random people, too. Okay. What about with you guys? Like, what would be one, like, one of the things that you definitely would not want your parents knowing about you? <laughs> My family, we're Christian, and, like, I'm not supposed to, like, cuss or, like, drink or stuff like that. And, <laughs> yeah, like that. Like, cussing and drinking. I don't do drugs, which I don't like that. But, yeah. What's the question? I don't remember. Like, what would you, you not want your parents to find out you did? It sucks. Duh. But you guys would say your parents definitely don't know? They definitely don't know about the drugs and the fights and everything about there. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. Well. Again, you, you're watching the PG version. Um, isn't it great that our kids are growing up in that environment? You guys, it's the world we live in. It's the world we live in. It's the reality of it all. It's the end times. It's, it's going to be this way. You want some good news? That's <laughs> what you're here for, right? To hear the good news. Good news. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. <laughs> the good news is God's church will always stand, and there will always be men and women who will stand. The good news is even though the world's against you and even though Satan is against you and even your own flesh is against you, the Bible says greater is he who is in you than he who is of the world. And that there's a serious power here within us, within my being, that the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead, he, he lives inside of me. I can look at all that stuff and go, that's, that's fine, but I'm not going down. Are you? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not backing off. I'll fight this thing to the end. That's why, that's why Paul writes to Timothy. He goes, look at me, I'm about to die. And I pulled it off. I lived through these times. You saw how I was beaten. You saw how I was abused. But I took it all. And guess what I'm going to do right now? He goes, there's a crown of righteousness that's waiting for me. And I'm going to be there. He goes, so you remember these words coming out of my mouth. He goes, no regrets. I'm fighting this thing. And I'm going to fight it to the end. The good news is even though, yes, absolutely, the youth and everything, it's, 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 go, it's getting worse, 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 worse. But that doesn't mean we pull our kids away from that and everything else. No, because the truth is that there are believers who in the midst of all that, they're standing. Man, this is what I do. I go around, I speak to high school students, college students all around the world. And you know what I'm finding? I'm finding a passion for God that I've never seen before. In all my years of doing ministry, I've never been more encouraged about the future of the church than I am right now. Because as people are getting more evil there is a church there is a remnant and there's these believers that they'll do anything for Jesus Christ and there, there's a new generation of believers and a lot of these these college students that are saying you know if church is just about us attending and not trying to swear too much and do the whole church attendance thing and let's grow a big church they go I'm not, I don't want any part of that anymore but if the church is really going to live this out and really die for Jesus Christ and really live against the world I want to be a part of something like that the good news is that there, there are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and they're living this out. I was speaking to a, I was speaking to a, a group of high school students, thousands of them, the other day. And, uh, and one of the counselors, because I was talking for a Compassion International and talking about sponsoring kids and even getting high school kids to sponsor kids overseas. And, and this, this lady goes, oh, you got you to meet one of my girls. And so I go and I meet this high school girl. How old are you? 16 years old. And I go, okay, well, tell me about her. Why do you want me to meet her? And uh, this lady goes, oh, she sponsors kids. I'm like, right on. So you're 16 years old and you're already sponsoring kids? How many kids you sponsor? 14. 14 kids at 30 bucks each? How do you do that as a high school student? Well, in the summers I work more. I work, you know, 60, 70 hours. I lifeguard and then I wait tables and then I work all year long. So, so while every other 16-year-old is saving up money for a car because they love themselves, you're saving children? See, that's not where my mind was when I was 16. And I'm telling you, there's a generation that's rising up and they're saying, you know what, we're going to stand for this stuff. We don't just want to attend church. We don't want to just... Man, and I... I'm telling you, it's just a very encouraging time to be a believer amidst the evil and everything else because we have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And there are young people who believe that and understand that. And just like the people in India right now that are standing up and saying, go ahead, I'll stay here. Go ahead, kill me. 
I'm not going to deny Jesus Christ. In the same way, we do that to a different degree here in America by abstaining from some of these things, running from some of these things, and being willing to stand up for Jesus Christ. And the church, the church isn't going to die. Jesus promised that. The gates of hell will storm against it, but it'll stand firm. She'll be there, and I'm going to be a part of that. I mean, the end's written, right? The end's written, and in the end, the church is there. And in the end, the church is worshiping forever and ever, and I'm going to be amongst that group of people. And I pray that you will be too. I mean, you understand why we do the things we do? It's because we don't want you to become lovers of yourself. Why is it that you walk in and suddenly you see these banners of all these people who have no clean drinking water? And why do you have a a bottle that tells you that in a few years from now, two-thirds of the world's population is going to be be looking for water desperately? 5.3 billion people. Why? Because we don't want you to be a lover of yourself. We want you to think, well, maybe it's more more important that that person lives then I have this standard of living. Just to consider that. Why is it that we talk about the inner city and why is it that we talk about, maybe we can build a rescue mission in the San Fernando Valley you know, for those people that are, that are homeless and maybe we can just have church inside the rescue mission. So all week long we're just helping people and then we'll push the beds aside on Sunday. Maybe it'll be less comfortable. You know, why, why is it that over on Tierra Hada we don't want to build a big church building? Instead, let's build Children's Hunger Fund and, and, and maybe, maybe some days we'll have to sit in the warehouse and we'll sit on, on sacks of beans rather than than on chairs. Why? Because we don't want to be lovers of self. We want to be lovers of people. Why would we consider, you know, why don't we just sit down on the grass and, and you know what, because someone else is starving to death. Someone, all these people are dying of diarrhea from unclean water. That's just, that's just so unfathomable to us. And for us to say, we're trying to teach you to say, you know what, it's okay, it's good to be a lover of people. See, I don't want to be a person that says, well, I wouldn't want Francis Chan to have to sweat and sit in the sun because I love Francis so much. I wouldn't want Francis to get wet in the rain, oh, because he's so important. I wouldn't want Francis to, to sit on a sack of rice or a sack of beans and actually have to do some manual labor. I, we, we need Francis to sit in a nice air-conditioned room in a nice little chair and everything else. Why? Because we so value Francis. I don't want to be about that. I want to be a person where I say, God, save me from myself. I don't want to love myself like this. I want to be a lover of people. I'm a lover of you. And the wonderful thing is that that's what Jesus came to do, is to save us, save us from ourselves, of loving ourselves and being consumed with ourselves and saying there's a better way to live. There's a better way to live. Believe it or not, it's actually when you lose your life that you'll find it. I know it sounds crazy, but you lose your life, you're going to find it. And you save your life, you're going to lose it. Everything's backwards. Jesus came in and he he says everything's backwards. The way you guys think, it's all backwards. You think if you love yourself more and more and more that you'll be happier and happier and happier. He goes, no, that's not the way I designed you. You learn to be a lover of God. You learn to be a lover of people. And pretty soon you'll live that fulfilled life. It's the thief that came to destroy and try to mess you guys up and thinking all this stuff is so great. He goes, no, God is great. Loving God is great. Loving people is great. And... That was Jesus' life.